Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Association of the United States Army's annual conference and trade show here in Washington, D.C., the number one gathering of U.S. Army leaders from around the world to discuss the service's future, its strategy, budgets, doctrine, technology, and more. Our coverage here is sponsored by Bell, a Textron company, Elbit Systems of America, L3 Technologies, Leonardo DRS, and Safran, and we're here at the General Dynamics stand to talk to Mike Peck, who is uh, Director of Business uh, Development uh, here, uh, former uh, United States Army Special Operator, uh, yeah. among, among many, a very long and illustrious career. Uh, every year we talk uh, about the investment you guys are making in vehicle uh, technology. Uh, every year it's called a Griffin. This year it's called a Griffin, but this year it's totally different than it was in last Griffins. Talk to us about this awesome vehicle behind you because Everything about it is different from signature reduction stuff you guys have on to a whopping gun uh, that can reach out and touch somebody in a, in a, in a very uh, pronounced way. You bet. This is our investment strategy over time. You know, two years ago we did Griffin 1 and it was focused on mobile protected firepower. Griffin 3, on the other hand, is now focused on the next generation combat vehicle. And their first priority is a Bradley replacement. So we've looked at the infantry fighting vehicle capabilities that the Army says they want. So we've developed this. It's almost on a common chassis, though. So the, the uh, Ajax chassis from the United Kingdom is the basis of the same engine, transmission, suspension. But all the other things on this thing are unique. So we have an underlying operating system that is agnostic to the kind of sensors you would have on it. It's a plug and play, give me your app, just like your uh, Android. So it, we don't, and we're not in, involved in anybody else's intellectual properties. We're only interested in making sure that you can integrate it on this platform. But the new, unique thing is that we've been, over the last two years, involved with Acreda, with Ardec, in developing a 50 millimeter cannon on a unique turret. And so the one you see here is a 50 millimeter cannon developed by ATK and Ardec, uh, Ardec fire control system, and our turret. So when you start from scratch with a turret design, then you can do a lot of things. And one of them is integrate all your sensor packages. So every sensor is integrated on this, runs on a, on a common operating platform. There's no uh, external hangers, or there's no add-ons later on. So you have active protection system, you have uh, you have the laser warning system. You have a UAV integrated system with a sensor and a warhead. We have the, the third gen FLIR in this one. So it is really a, a unique uh, design. It's set up for a crew of two and six passengers in the back. Uh, the turret elevates to 85 degrees, which makes it a little interesting view of the of the turret up in the air. But the Army says they got a problem in the urban uh, battle, so this kind of solves some of those problems. Uh, and so th we're using it just like we did Griffin 1, is Army, come and take a look at this. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you don't like. Uh, and then we'll make an iteration, and by next fall we'll have a different version of the Griffin 4 with uh, the, the modifications that the Army thinks would be necessary to make it applicable for their mission. Um, that, I mean, that is extraordinary elevation, but yes, I mean, aside from saying like, hey, you know, we can do anti-air stuff, that really would be in a very close in fight. If you have a target that is uh, very, very high, you can, you can nail that in the 50 uh, uh, millimeter round is, is something that packs uh, a tremendous uh, punch, right? I mean, the, the bullet weight is what compared to a 25 millimeter? It's about six times the power of a 25 millimeter. It's not two, it's right. six. Right. And so uh, the, then that comes with that with some unique characteristics and the turret has to be a little bit bigger because it has to accommodate that size of ordnance. Right. And so so your, your baskets that hold the uh, ammunition have to be bigger. So the turret itself is almost as wide as the vehicle. It still has a fairly nice width profile. It's a little high, but that's because they want 85 degree elevation on the gun. Right. Um, and and uh, what's the muzzle velocity on the on the cannon? I don't know. We haven't really gone out and shot it yet. Okay. Got They're it. still doing the the uh, the trades on the ammunition. That's still in development. So, in just in case the 50 millimeter isn't available by the, by the time the Army wants this thing built, 
the Trunnion accommodates a 30 millimeter, oh, like really? the one we have on Stryker. Okay, all right, that's uh, that's great. And and what I always love is, uh, you know, as you go up from 25 to 50, it's actually exponential. It's not just the doubling of size Correct. in terms of the the the, the mass uh, of the round. Now, talk to us a little bit about the cladding that you have on the vehicle as well, because you know, signature reduction uh, and optical. I mean, I could see this being very very interesting. Talk to us about what you're doing yeah, and demonstrating. Yeah, this is one it. of one of our contributors called Armor Works. This, this is their Tacticam uh, camouflage, and uh, they're in test right now and uh, pr gonna provide it to the Army for the Army's test, but it is an IR heat and acoustic signature reduction uh, camouflage, so it, it's a multi-purpose kind of camouflage, and it does give us a little wow. <laughs> well, but I mean, you can also see how, right, I mean, what was one of the challenges, right? Armored vehicles are very slab-sided. They actually tend to stand out even if the camouflage pattern is, is right. And then you have to worry about netting, which is a problem. Whereas with this, I could see it, if you get the color mix absolutely right, it would it would really contribute to it blending into a background even without getting into any of the reflected or the acoustic uh, signature. Reduction. Correct, and the fact that it's in panel. So you can take a panel off, get gets damaged, put a new panel on. So it's not a, a, a single solution. So you can adapt this kind of camouflage to any platform. It's uh, and so it'll be a mix and match kind of thing. But we think from a from a show perspective, we wanted to be able to grab people's attention and this our, our partnership with uh, Armorwork certainly did that. Uh, it, it does, and, and what's neat is the number of people who come up and actually touch it to see like, is it soft, is it styrofoam, is it, uh, it's a very, very high dense uh, density uh, um, of foam. Now, you know, in terms of the back end of the vehicle, um, you know, there are a lot of folks in the U.S. Army who really liked the CV-90 a lot, um, thought that in some respects it, it was the right vehicle, but it's an eight person in the back, and then Army wants nine people, and you're saying you've got um, six. Six, six in the back. So talk to us a little bit about that dynamic, given that, you know, the Army still wants to stay with that nine man. Well, currently, the Army and the Bradley has have three and five, so this stays on that same kind of force structure. Uh, capability inside the armor brigades. We we anticipate, and the Army's kind of uh, told us, that they're going to stay with that same structure. They're not going to try to pile the whole squad in one vehicle. You remember GCV was designed to carry the whole squad. Hence and that it, nine uh, number. Yeah, and, and it was a little large. Uh, a little, it might be on the <laughs> kind side. It was really big. and It was said, like out of a German World War II. Looked like a building moving on the track. Uh, and the Army decided, uh, well, that's not really what we want. But you're a soft operator. Everything looks like a building that's walking right. on Yeah, we'd sneak. We're, we're small. We uh, have a small <laughs> signature. But but the Army, after seeing what it, they said they wanted, decided, that's not what we want. That's when we started saying, well, we better show it to them early. Then they could get the idea of what the what the package looks like, and are they comfortable with that, or are they not comfortable with that? And so the the conversations we've had have been pretty positive. That we're close. Some of the things we've done were really good, and some of the things they may change some uh, potential requirements to accommodate a different look. Uh, but that's the value of bringing of our investment strategy is to bring something like this to a show and have all the senior army leaders take a look at it and make an assessment and then they can go back and say, hmm, 85 degrees, is that what we really want? Or are we satisfied with something a little less? And then what does that do to the design of the turret and the vehicle? So uh, it's been beneficial for us as a, a manufacturer and solution provider, a platform provider for the Army, to get this discussion early rather than late. Right. At GCV, it was late and it looked like a house. This looks pretty good. Um, where, have you been having conversations with General Kaufman, uh, who is the cross-functional team lead for the next generation combat vehicle? Do you have a clear enough idea about what it is that the Army roughly wants, what the baseline is going to be yeah, for this? I think, I think the Army is really, really close. Uh, there are some things they might change, like gun elevation and a few of those kinds of things. They still have a decision to make on crew size. Is it a two-man crew or a three-man crew? So we're watching that. We're talking to him. He'll be in this afternoon. We'll have some more conversations with him. Uh, but he's just down the road from us. So we, we have seen him a couple of times. And uh, I, I'm, I think the Army's done it right with this uh, CFT organizational construct because they put one guy in charge. 
of the requirements. One guy in charge of, of developing what it is the Army really wants and then has the community support from the Army uh, functional areas to help him come up with the solution set and then eventually go to contract and, and get it. I think it's going to be beneficial to the Army. It's certainly beneficial to industry. Um, talk to us a little bit about uh, Futures Command, right? I mean, so while folks are applauding uh, to some measure the cross-functional teams, there are a lot of folks who are, who are saying, look, how does this fit into the Army acquisition enterprise, right? You have Dr. Jetty and his teams, you have TRADOC that still does a part of what it does, you still have ARCIC doing what it does, and now you have these cross-functional teams who are, who are going to be doing it. I understand the, the dotted line or dual-hatted nature of General Ostrowski and a couple of other folks in the acquisition organization, but is, is this clear enough for you as somebody who's been in this business for a long time to know you know, where, you know what, what the points of entry and, and what the new ecosystem is really going to look like from a functional standpoint? It broadens our uh, customer base. Because now I've got three or four CFTs that we have some uh, integration uh, of our product line with. So it, uh, it spreads me a little bit wider. But what it does, is it gives me a single point of contact for everything up until they throw the, the ball over the fence to the acquisition community. And the nice thing is the acquisition community is involved from the very beginning in the de development of the requirements. So uh, the CFT can say, I want this, and the acquisition guys who are experienced in that, in the development of the vehicle say, here's the impact of that decision. And they can make some different kinds of decisions that way. So I think it's beneficial for everybody. Um, do you think that um, what, power, um, that has been a question on ground combat vehicle. Uh, the Army was trying to experiment and look at a number of different power sources. The Brits have tried to do that. From the standpoint of modifying the power plant for this, what are you guys doing in the propulsion element of this? You know, there's uh, General Motors is making its debut as General Motors defense here in, in a a uh, uh, powerful way, they're looking at you know sort of a hybrid technology, they're looking at it as an agnostic power plant that in the event that the Army chooses it. Talk to us about some of the propulsive technology that you guys are considering and the onboard power, considering that now everything is a higher power load than ever before on a vehicle. Well, we've done an extensive amount of work on electric drive kinds of vehicles with in-hub electric uh, motors. Uh, that's one option. The other option, is, quite honestly, is inline starter generators. Those, those uh, develop a huge capacity for electronics and le electrical uh, storage. And you still have to store it somewhere, you still have to have it available, it has to surge at times. Uh, but we're exploring all of that. Tardec is a partner with us on inline starter generator. Uh, we're doing our own IRAD on the in-hub electric motors. So there's a lot of options out there for the Army. Some of them apply better to other uh, one platform over another platform. Uh, but, but we've been watching this for a long, long time. We've got some really smart people in our uh, that work for our chief technology officer, and uh, and they're they're really working with the Army to decide what are the limits that you guys expect from uh, the capacity on, a, on electronics. But when you go get buy a car, do you worry about reliability? They're all reliable. What are you worried about? Can my iPod play on my radio? Can I get satellite radio? Do I have waypoint navigation? Everybody's worried about now the, the attributes of the electronics, and the Army is not any different. So we see that as growing, not getting smaller, but at some point in time you're going to tap out, and, and you're just not going to need any more than that. And I think we're, we're at the point where we've got some pretty good solutions that can be applied across the board. Mike Peck, Director of Business Development here at General Dynamics Land Systems. Sir, it's always a pleasure. It's not AUSA unless we get a chance to talk. Thanks, Bob. We appreciate it.